posting on Facebook and on our website, so please remember to guard your privacy as you see fit. We acknowledge that the First Presbyterian Church of Barrie and many of our homes are located on the unceded and ancestral homes of the Abenaki people. We acknowledge that they are still here, continuing to honor and bring light to their heritage, and that we benefit every single day from the theft of their land. like to welcome everyone who's here today, um, here in person, and we have folks on Zoom. Normally we see their faces over yonder. And we'd also like to welcome our guest, Teresa Weaver, who's here from the Bethany United Church in Montpelier. So thank you for joining us and, and giving our, our message thank today. Thank you, Kathy. I, I wasn't, it's not my turn to speak, but I have to ask, have the Butterflies always been here? Have I just not noticed them, or are they fairly new? This, they are so lovely. I'm, I'm sitting here somewhat mesmerized. They're dancing to Allison's lively song there. I was thinking, I don't know. I might not 
be able to pull myself away from watching the butterflies. Anyway, always so happy to be here, and I'm, I'm interrupting Kathy, but I, I realize that, you know, I know you from so many different places and from so long ago. My sweetheart, Paul, is here today in the back, and I just introduced him to Jennifer, uh, whom I know from McFarland House days, so long ago, and, and uh, Peggy and others I know from the hospital, and you guys from Habitat, right? And um, so... Um, it's it's great. It's just great to be here, and I know you from another place, you know, so just wonderful to be here. Now I'll go take my place. I just didn't want to forget to ask about the butterflies <laughs> because I think they're absolutely beautiful. Who Whose design was it? Uh, it's really so lovely. Thank you. And it's also nice with the ceiling fans because they flutter. They flutter. Yeah, and I say, I haven't been in the choir. We haven't been in, I haven't been part of the choir for a while. And when I was, I always enjoyed looking at the stained glass up here. The colors are stunning, and I haven't seen it for months. And sitting here this morning, I I looked up and I, I caught my breath because it's just so beautiful. One thing you should know, Teresa, is when I am the worship, when I'm the MC of services, something usually goes awry. I either forget a section or move a section. So just to let you, I've even been known to cry when I've introduced a, a book that I had read or something. So beware, like anything can happen. So don't, don't worry about interrupting about butterflies. Well, welcome, we're glad you're all here. Please join me in the call to worship. We will walk this day with you, O oh God, and you will walk with us. We will walk this day with you, O Christ, and you will walk with us. Calling us to follow you, helping us to set aside all which holds us back. We will walk this day with you, O Spirit, and you will walk with us. from the purple hymnal, number 408, there's a sweet, sweet spirit.
While we may yearn to be like Jesus, to truly follow Jesus, we know that the paths we often choose are not the ones he would lay before us. Let us confess our inertia, our fear, and our desire to maintain the status quo. We pray together. You call us and we ignore you, listening instead to the voices of this world. You call us to walk with you, and we take a path of our own choosing. You call us to be your voice in this world, to be your hands in this world, to be your feet in this world, to proclaim your peace, your comfort, forgiveness, healing, love, and grace. We confess that we find your call to be daunting. Forgive us, open our ears, call us again, guide our feet, and use us. Let us pray silently. Whether you hear a voice from the heavens or a still, small voice in your hearts, listen carefully for the love of God. Believe and accept God's love and live in God's forgiving freedom. Amen. Peace be with you. And do we do a passing of the peace here? Yes, well, let's do that. Now for the prayer of illumination. God of extravagant grace, may your spirit refresh our hearts through the reading of the scriptures, that we may perceive all the good we can, we can do as followers of Jesus. I'll be sharing the first scripture, um, John chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. Now by this we know that we have come to know him, if we obey his commandments. Whoever says, I have come to know him, but does, does not obey his commandments is a liar, and in such a person the truth does not exist. But whoever obeys his word, truly in this person the love of God has reached perfection. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says, I abide in him, ought to walk with the same way as he walked. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you have had from the very beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. 
Yet I am writing you a new commandment that is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says, I am the light, while hating a brother or sister, is still in darkness. Whoever loves a brother or sister abides in the light, and in, in such a person there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates a brother or sister is in the darkness, walks, walks in the darkness, and does not know the way to go, because the darkness has brought on blindness. And the gospel reading is from Mark, the first chapter, a familiar reading, a familiar um, image, story, um, verses 16 through 20. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending the nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired men and followed him. The most compelling evidence that the church exists for mission is Jesus' own ministry which was three years of nonstop walking. The list of places he walked to, from, and through include names we know well, like Cana and Nazareth and Jerusalem, and names that tie our tongues, like Tyre and Sidon and Syrophoenicia, Decapolis, Gennesaret, and Gerizines. And I had to look most of those up, the pronunciation, that is. Jesus probably slept very well, and every once in a while he went on a short retreat, and of course, sometimes he had to make his way by boat. But mostly, the Gospels have him walking. When it was time for Jesus to begin his ministry, he did not set up shop at home or build a chapel or a recruiting station. He didn't tell his disciples, bring the people to me. He walked everywhere his feet could take him. In the Gospel of Mark, it seems that Jesus is always walking somewhere, and the disciples are almost always walking with him. Not the other way around, not the disciples walking and Jesus walking with them. The reading we just heard has Jesus walking, and encountering Simon, Andrew, James, and John, he calls to them to follow him, leave, and they leave everything behind to do just that, to follow him walking. Here are some of the beginning sentences of paragraphs in the early chapters of Mark. They went to Capernaum. He got up and went to a deserted place. He went throughout Galilee, proclaiming the message. On the Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields. He went up the mountain. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of Gerasenes. He left that place and came to his hometown. Then he went among the villages, teaching. He set out, and they went away to the region of Tyre. And on and on and on, walking everywhere, with his disciples in tow. They were traveling companions for each other, but Jesus set the pace, determined the destination, and chose the path. His disciples may have walked side by side with him. They may even have run ahead, but they were still following him. We often talk about God walking with us, especially in hard times, right? When people are asked how they summoned the courage to overcome fear or how they carried that terrible burden, they sometimes say, God walked with me during those troubles. This way of thinking about God as our ever-faithful companion on our journey through this life 
is very comforting. At the same time, Micah tells us that we are expected to walk humbly with God. When we are invited to walk with God or Jesus, they do the choosing. We know from the Gospels that going with Jesus is a heck of a lot different than Jesus going with us. It's not us saying, mm, well, we're going this way, you want to come along? But Jesus saying, I'm headed down this road, join me. We can imagine that our walk may take some unexpected turns with Jesus in charge of the itinerary and the logistics. The walk may be longer than we counted on. We may be asked to leave our well-supplied backpacks behind. And those shabby neighborhoods and danger zones we'd like to avoid are probably on his preferred route. The destination? Let's just say you need a lot of faith to keep moving, keep following, without knowing where it will ultimately lead you. The late writer, Frederick Beekner, in a reflection on the feet of Jesus, notes that when the two Marys found the empty tomb and running in fear and joy to let the others know, encountered the resurrected Jesus, they did not reach to touch his hands or his face, but instead, Beekner writes, took hold of his feet and worshipped him. Actually, Beekner didn't write that. It's in the gospel. They took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And Beekner advises, generally speaking, if you want to know who you really are, as distinct from who you like to think you are, keep an eye on where your feet take you. Where are your feet taking you? Several years ago, my late husband and I enjoyed a camping trip in Wyoming and South Dakota. While we did way more driving than walking, my feet still got plenty of exercise and I returned home with filthy sneakers. We toured the geysers of Yellowstone, we followed the trails, around the bases of Mount Rushmore and Devil's Tower. We heeded the beware of rattlesnake signs on the paths at the Little Bighorn National Monument and in the Badlands. But when I reflect on our trip, one thing that stands out in my mind and surprises and disappoints me is where I chose not to walk. We planned to drive from the Badlands to the Red Cloud Heritage Center on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. We didn't have GPS then, and the MapQuest route had us backtrack to Rapid City. I hate backtracking. But the paper map showed a much more direct route through the reservation. Well, we asked some people about this. And the first South Dakotan I asked about it said, probably it's safer to go the longer route because there are so many powwows happening. Oh, no. He said, but because there are so many powwows not happening now, many of them are not around. The next two people seemed surprised that I wanted to take the direct route but they showed it to me on their maps, which included Route 33, a nice little shortcut from Wounded Knee right to the Heritage Center. That's what we took, Route 33. Well, that gravel road soon morphed into a narrow, deeply rutted dirt path bordered only by acres and acres of unruly mixed brush. I was the driver, and I labored to keep our tiny rented Chevy Spark from body, bottoming out. I'm saying, could this really be Route 33? With my voice getting more excited with every question. How could this road, how could this road, I was so upset, be on an official map? Maybe we read the sign wrong when we started out. At the crest of every rise, we could see that the road went on and on and on with no end in sight, no sign of human habitation. 
Some of those rises unexpectedly spit our little spark out into mud ruts, prompting Tom to raise his voice. Just keep going, Teresa. Don't stop. Don't stop. We'll get stuck. By coincidence, Tom had recently seen a documentary about the gang violence on the Pine Ridge Reservation. Here we were on a seemingly endless, dangerous road to where? Surely not our destined destination. My rising anxiety turned to fear, real fear, that led me to feel we were in foreign, hostile territory. We'd be on this road until we ran out of gas, and that little car only has a 10-gallon tank. Or we got stuck in a rut, on the, or the road became impassable, or just ended, ended in the middle of nowhere. Bad things would happen to us here. We would have to get out and walk. That wasn't going to happen. No, I was not going to be doing any walking there. Of course, Pine Ridge is exactly where Jesus would be walking. Exactly healing old and new wounds, promoting peace and understanding, reaching out to people others would go miles to avoid and went miles to avoid, walking in solidarity with those living on the margins of society. When Jesus walked, he preached and he taught and he healed. He performed what some call miracles, an impossible catch of fish, Water changed to wine, 5,000 hungry mouths filled. And everywhere he went, he noticed things that others overlooked. He tended to people whom others disregarded. He challenged the traditions and the laws that rewarded some of God's children and left many others in the dust. He walked in foreign territory. He walked into uncomfortable in dangerous situations. Did he walk fearlessly? The Gospels don't say, but they sure report that he walked and spoke and acted boldly. When Jesus walked, he reached out in word and deed with the contentious, contentious good news that everyone deserves to be noticed and have their needs met. The Gospels are full of Jesus paying attention to the invisible nobodies of his time, the ones with blindness, mental illness, epilepsy, paralysis, leprosy, the adulterers, the widows, the children. This was the mission of Jesus, to walk boldly where others would not tread, reaching out to change people and society. We followers of Jesus need to notice where our feet are taking us and where they are not. Engaging in ministry doesn't mean we have to go out of our way to be in danger, but it sometimes means making ourselves uncomfortable. And by the way, Route 33 took us right to the Heritage Center eventually, and I did calm down and felt terrible. Charles Sheldon, a classic social gospel preacher who once pastored the Waterbury Congregational Church, put on old work clothes and beat the Topeka, Kansas streets during the economic depression of the 1890s in an effort to relate better to the plight of the common person. Has anybody read his book published in 1897 called In His Steps? It's a real classic. It's a product of his shock at the indifference of the Christian community to the suffering around them. And the book opens with a scene of a sick, unemployed man stumbling forward from the back of a church, down the aisle, into a church service to give testimony just before he collapses. And this is his testimony. What did Jesus mean when he said, follow me? What do you Christians mean by following the steps of Jesus? What do you mean when you sing, I'll go with him, with him all the way? 
It seems to me there's an awful lot of trouble in the world that somehow wouldn't exist if all the people who sing such songs went out and lived them. Do you mean that you are suffering and denying yourselves and trying to save lost, suffering humanity just as I understand Jesus did? What do you mean by it? I see the ragged edge of things a good deal. I understand that there are more than 500 men in this city in my case. Most of them have families. My wife died four months ago. I'm glad she is out of trouble. My little girl is staying with another family until I find a job. Somehow I get puzzled when I see so many Christians living in luxury and singing, Jesus, I my cross have taken all to leave and follow thee. And remember how my wife died in a tenement in New York City, gasping for air and asking God to take the little girl, too. Of course, I don't expect you people can prevent everyone from dying of starvation, lack of proper nourishment and tenement air. But what does following Jesus mean? A member of a church was the owner of the tenement where my wife died, and I have wondered if following Jesus all the way was true in his case. Is that what you mean by following his steps? As we age, we become increasingly aware of our mortality. Anybody? I suspect that more than a handful of us are asking whether we are living out our life's purpose. What is the meaning of our lives? What should we be doing in our remaining time? Frederick Buechner has something to say about that, too. It's, it's often quoted. You might have heard it before. It was in a short essay on the definition of vocation. He concludes, the place God calls you to is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. Have you heard that one before? The place where God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The world's deep hunger isn't one thing, and it isn't located in one place. It's everywhere your feet can take you. It's in your own church. It's in Barrie and East Barrie and Williamstown and Orange and these days in Plainfield. It's in our cities, and it's on our Indian reservations. It's in prisons and orphanages and refugee camps. It's in Ukraine and Gaza and Israel and Sudan. It's at our southern border. It's in all the places Jesus would go, the places Jesus goes, all the places his feet can lead you comfortably and very likely, uncomfortably. Now, only you know what your deep gladness is. Just don't take the rest of your life deciding where it intersects with the world's deepest hunger. None of us has that long to fulfill our calling. If we are truly to follow Jesus, we must put on our walking shoes now. We must let our feet take us places where we notice, as Jesus did, those who are marginalized, where we name injustice and then recognize in ourselves the power to change lives and to change the way this world works. Micah tells us that God expects us to seek justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. Humbly means understanding that as humans, we might not always be going exactly the right way, and we depend on God for direction. But humble doesn't mean wimpy. So while we may not walk entirely fearlessly, let us walk boldly, as Jesus did. As we walk in the Christian faith, let us give thanks that God walks with us. Yes, God walks with us. That we are not alone even in that lonesome valley. Let us also be mindful 
that when we walk through this world, it is our Christian responsibility to discern the path that God has prepared for us to walk the way of Jesus, to follow his steps, to walk with Jesus wherever those steps may lead. Guide our feet, sweet Jesus, as we participate in your glorious mission of bringing love and justice to all of God's children. Amen. Our hymn is number 738. So just a quick announcement that the uh, Flood Recovery Committee will be meeting after church um, for those who are part of the committee and on Zoom, just plan to join through the meditation link at 11.15. I think we should be pretty settled by then. And so, and then also, um, you know, prayers as we go into this next week, Fiona gets married on Friday, so it's great. Uh, celebrations and joy as we come together as a family and um, that we are very blessed that Carl will be also doing the service for us. I just want to ask everyone to take a look at the church as you leave. The painting is almost done. It is green again. The dust is gone. Let's move into joys and concerns that we would like to share. Um, I think we should uh, recognize the progress that Jim Taylor has made in his recovery, um, a joy, and ask for prayers of patience and strength as he continues down that road. Let us all say thanks be to God. Be to God. Yeah. Yeah. And here are 
our prayers for continued Each week we pray for a different person or family in our church. And this week we invite you to keep Lester, Lisa, Allison, Erica, and Jillian Felch in your prayers. Gracious Lord, we give thanks for them and their presence in this congregation. Hold them in the palm of your hand and let them feel your love. Give them the wisdom and strength to do your will and the faith and courage to face whatever challenges may arise. As part of being the Connectional Presbyterian Church, we keep in our prayers other ministries within the Presbytery of Northern New England. And this week, our prayers are for the New Portland Community Church of Maine, who are in a in pastoral transition. Let us all be in a spirit of prayer. <clears throat> God, often we lose track of everything for which we ought to be thankful. Going to sleep in a comfortable bed, waking up, having a window to look out and trees and sky to see, farmers, wheat fields, chickens, and orange groves from which we get our toast, eggs, and juice cars to get us to church on time, shoes to protect our feet so we can walk and walk in the warm sun. There are at least a million things on this list, God. Help us to be more mindful so we can be more grateful. Dear God, we pray for all who seek healing of body, mind, or spirit. We pray that they know they are not alone, and we ask that we might somehow be a blessing to them. When we walk, O oh God, may it be in the paths you choose for us. May it be with your feet and limbs. May we walk carrying you in our bodies. May we walk recognizing the beauty and love that is before us, behind us, above and below us. Although we would like a smooth, newly paved road with clear markings and bright, bold signs telling us where to go, you sometimes give us a rough mountain path with rocks, ruts, holes, dirt, and danger. Give us confident strides to follow the way of Jesus. For that way brings us to new vistas and opportunities of service that we never would encounter on the safe road. And now we pray in the words that he gave his friends to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
gratitude for all the blessings in your lives and with concern for the needs of people and creation, you make your offering to support the mission of this church. We ask God's blessing on these gifts that they may be used to advance the reign of mercy and justice. Amen. Our closing hymn is Just a Closer Walk with Thee. I think you can sit now. <laughs> Children of God, it's time to take off your shoes, step out of your comfort zone, and wade with trust into the stream of God's mercy. Stand still for a moment, barefoot, on holy ground. Let the healing waters wash your feet. Take a deep breath as love soaks into your soul. Be silent and listen for God's word. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? How shall we worship our God? We have heard what God requires of us. 
Leave empty talk and pride behind. We must walk the walk. Prepare to step out in faith, even into troubled waters. Only God knows where we might need to go. Don't be afraid. Jesus will guide our steps along the way, teaching us to walk humbly, to love boldly, to serve God with body, mind, soul, and strength. Let us pray for the humility and the courage to follow where the Spirit leads. Amen.